Next, from Springfield, we sit down with the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court, Lloyd Carmeyer. We ask Chief Justice Carmeyer about the issues he's looking to address as he heads the court, how technology is changing the practice and application of the law, and whether Illinois has a funding crisis of the court system. We'll also ask him about other topics concerning the state's legal system. This runs about 50 minutes. Chief Justice Lloyd Carmeyer, thanks for joining us again on the Illinois Channel. It's my pleasure. Thank it's you. It's been a while much. since we had a chance to get together. We were just talking right before we started here. It's hard to believe that it was uh, 2004, the last time we did our, or the first time we did our first interview, uh, when you were first running uh, for the Supreme Court and you won an election that was uh, kind of a nasty race, actually. But uh, uh, we appreciate you joining us, and now you are here sitting as the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court, having taken that uh, office uh, October of 2016. That's correct. It just goes to show you that if you live long enough, sometimes good things happen. <laughs> <clears throat> One of the things the Chief Justice does, and maybe we ought to say, what do you do as a Chief Justice versus other justices? Um, but one of the things, as I understand it, is you, you have some items that you might want to focus on as the chief. What are some of the issues that you look to address in your term? As I indicated at the outset, my primary goal is to continue the programs that have been started in the past. Access to justice by Chief Justice Kilbride, Justice Garman got very involved with e-filing and we're, getting, we're closing in on that now. Um, as, as we go along, other things come up that uh, catch my attention and, and we'll focus on those. But it's really uh, trying to complete things. I have no specific agenda, nothing that I am worried about leaving as a, a, my mark on the court other than trying to do a good job and leading the court in the right direction. We'll talk about some of the <clears throat> issues as we can and, and the viewers hopefully understand there's certain things you can't comment on, uh, nothing that would be coming before the court. But also we want to talk about process. Let's, let's talk about the process of the Supreme Court. Uh, how often do you meet and when do you meet? Our court meets uh, on beginning on the second Mondays of September, November, January, March, and May. Uh, the term is either two or three weeks, depending upon the time that we need to complete. Uh, I, as the Chief Justice, am responsible for setting the agenda, the, the um, matters that will come before the court. The clerk sets the cases that are ready for oral argument. If we're not in term, if we're not here in Springfield, where we meet all together, uh, we do all of our primary grunt work, the research, the reading, in our own chambers with our own staff. And our chambers are back in our, each of our respective districts. And I know from when the <laughs> Illinois Channel has covered some of the cases in this uh, courtroom that we sit in the Supreme Court uh, chamber in Springfield, uh, there are certain days when you'll hear two cases, certain days when you'll hear four cases. Uh, how do you prepare for that? And, so, and I should say, too, I remember some cases where the amount of evidence would be piled up here on the desk where you all sit, where we could hardly see you as justices, because uh, it would be uh, literally a foot of paperwork sitting in front of you. We, uh, we always have uh, all of the briefs on the bench in front of us. Until recently, each justice had his or her own set of briefs because so many of us have gone to uh, reading briefs either um, um, online digitally or um, on our iPads. We don't all have those, but we still have them stacked up there. All of us will have read all of the briefs, the replies, anything that we need. We've also had our staff go over some of the cases for us in advance. And I have a pretty good idea of some of the questions that I may want to ask. Uh, but I find that as the oral arguments go along, and that's why I think there's value to oral arguments, um, trying to clarify what, what's being presented in the briefs, what the lawyers are trying to get to, is very helpful by the questions that are asked from the bench. The other thing that the questions, I think, help do is it helps uh, clarify for my fellow justices, for each other, the questions that are being asked, some points that maybe we need to focus on. I was going to say, when you, when you read the briefs, um, in your experience, do you, has it been your experience that when you come into the, hear the oral arguments, do you have 
I would imagine in certain cases you've already maybe kind of formed an opinion about the legal issues involved and how you might rule. What role does the listening to the oral arguments here play versus reading the briefs and the, and the homework you would do on a case? Before I comment on that, I want to remind you what it says on the above the doors is Audi Ultra Impartum, here the other side, <laughs> which means we should not have for, formed an opinion yet as to what our ultimate conclusion is going to be. Certainly by reading the briefs, and I take this uh, also from one of my predecessors, Justice Rarick, would say, well, I read the appellant's brief. Yeah, I think, I think he's right or she's right. But then I read the appellee's brief. Yeah, I think they're right. But that's, uh, so that's what gets us to the oral arguments, because you've got good lawyers uh, generally filing very good briefs on the points of law. They're usually accurate on the presentation of the facts, sometimes not, and, and the, through the process of oral arguments, we can question what's actually in the record that went before the trial court and the appellate court, and what the lawyers are just saying they wish were in the record, something that they might uh, allude to in their briefs. The other value of oral arguments, we may have a pretty good notion of what the what we believe are the um, important um, issues in the case, but occasionally, by the time we get to oral argument, the lawyers will have changed and maybe concede a point based upon um, either additional research or what have you. That always surprises me, uh, but it, but it does help us then at the end of the day to focus on what is what's remaining as the the salient issue. And <clears throat> as you then have read the, uh, the briefs, you've heard the oral arguments. At a certain point then, you will sit down with your fellow justices around a conference room table and discuss the case, as I understand. Is that That's more or less a process? Immediately after oral argument, usually at the conclusion of uh, any number that we have uh, during the day. Today, for example, we had three. Uh, we'll go back into the conference room and we'll take an impression vote. An impression vote does not um, tie anyone to it absolutely saying that's the way I would vote whenever the opinion is circulated. But it helps uh, us formulate, uh, the, those of us who are assigned to writing an opinion, what direction the court might go. And during the course of that impression vote and before, the authoring justice can certainly ask questions and say, now what do you think about this issue? Or should it be decided on this issue or on another? Um, and help focus where the court goes. There are times when um, okay, we'll get a case and the impression vote is all one way and the ultimate uh, decision may go the other. That's not the, the norm, but that does happen because after the case, after we have oral arguments and we get the cases back to our own respective chambers, um, additional research, in-depth research and is done by our staff and then we start to draft an opinion and by the time we have that done and circulated, everyone is much more familiar with the case and the issues than they were even at the time of oral argument. You know, one of the things I'm kind of fascinated about, on one hand we say the law is the law. It's written right there in black and white, right? And yet you have good lawyers who are sitting on the appellate court, <clears throat> good lawyers arguing the case before the Supreme Court, uh, people who were good lawyers before they were elected to the Illinois Supreme Court, and you'll have differences of opinion. How, if the law is the law, how do we have these variations of opinion on what the law means? Some of that starts with what the legislature does. And we, uh, we had a um, night when we had oral arguments with the legislators here last year, and they were surprised that we looked at the legislative debates on what the, the legislators intended because sometimes those laws are not very clear what, what is actually meant. And we'll look at the debates. And of course that's a, that's a fertile area for a difference of opinion as to what a law might mean. And it always surprises me, it, uh, as, as long as I've been practicing law and been a judge, that there can always still be issues <laughs> that have to be decided. It seems to me after this amount of time we should have everything taken care of and everything categorized, but we don't. Uh, today, we had an oral argument, and I won't get into any details, but a question was asked uh, of one of the lawyers, has this been a, an issue in the past? And, one, and the lawyer said, no, it's always been assumed that was the law. And the other lawyer then said, 
Well, I wasn't the trial lawyer, but uh, so I can't take credit for this, uh, uh, asking for this interpretation, but it's something that is a case of first impression and, and one that we need to resolve. So it becomes an important issue, not only for that case, but for going forward. And, and that's, uh, we should also point out, I mean, the other thing you will look at is what is the legal precedence of, from previous case law of how it was decided by other courts? We do that. We, we look to our case law as a precedent. And we won't overrule that unless there's good reason to do that. We, we believe in the principle of stare decisis. If it's been decided, it should stay unless there's a principled reason for change. And that can come from change in circumstances, change in what's going on in the world. Um, sometimes a poorly reasoned case because the, uh, in the past because the, the lawyers may not have focused on that issue and it kind of got to be, a, I don't want to say a throwaway issue in an opinion, but it may not have been the important issue, but it, it comment, opinion commented on something and once that's there, and, it's, and if, uh, if it has meaning in the case, it becomes the law, and we have to follow that. We do change, and, then, and when we do, we, we say why we're changing it. We, we look to appellate court opinions for the, uh, for the rationale that they might use in deciding a case, and sometimes say that's, that's a perfect rationale and we'll adopt that, but we don't, we're not bound by appellate court opinions. Of course, as far as interpretation of the U.S. Constitution is concerned, we are bound by what the U.S. Supreme Court says. However, we get to interpret the Illinois Constitution, and the U.S. Supreme Court will follow our interpretation unless there's a conflict between Illinois and federal um, law or our constitutions. We, we might say, of course, this would be true of probably every state, but I mean, a number of the cases then that you would decide on uh, c over the years, you as a court, uh, could go up then to the U.S. Supreme Court and it could be appealed to them as the final arbitrator of that. So uh, I don't know if you happen to know offhand, do you know how the record is of the Illinois Supreme Court vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Supreme Court if you're being upheld mostly? Or? It's, it's fairly good. Um, there was a case called... Um, Escobedo versus Illinois, which was two years before Miranda versus Arizona, which changed. 1964. 64, 66, that era, yes. And the Illinois Supreme Court um, wrote an opinion in Escobedo versus Illinois that was really overruled by the U.S. Supreme Court, having to do with uh, uh, voluntariness of confessions and that type of thing. And, and the Miranda warnings, of course, came out of the Miranda case. But since then, there aren't a lot of cases that have gone up. Um, I think I've had only one in the years I've been on the court, and they affirmed, which I was very pleased to see, of course. Um, and we, there was one that, uh, that had to do with search and seizures and uh, dog sniffing that uh, was decided before, our, before I got on the court in a four to three decision, and the, the Supreme Court said the sniff was okay. Uh, the I think it was a here. question of uh, unreasonable search and seizure. Right. Uh, Highway 55, someone was pulled over. They brought out the dogs and sniffed out the drugs, and they said that was a violation of the Fourth Amendment protections. I think that's right. Uh, and when, is a, when does the stop become unreasonable? Is it prolonging? And it was, it was directed at that. Cabalas was the name of that case. Going back along the theme of how do we decide, how do we take ourselves as humans and we form these courts and then and you say, so one of the guidelines we've talked about, how are the laws written within the uh, Illinois legislature, what was the original intent? Now sometimes a case might come to you that's municipal law uh, arises. Do you actually go back and look at the judgment of how it was argued at an aldermatic <clears throat> level? I don't recall that we've had that. And we've had some, uh, especially it's usually Chicago municipal ordinances, and we have that. I don't recall that we've seen a record of the, uh, the aldermen there arguing. Uh, of course, we, we have some rules of statutory construction which apply to municipal law construction, and that is, first of all, the meaning should be plain from the language itself. And if it isn't, then you look at... Uh, that uh, the intent, what it looks like the intent has, what, other, what the entire statute is directed at, and we do get into the uh, legislative debates. However, those can be used a couple different ways. 
if one senator or representative gets up and says, this is what the law means, that's one senator saying that. It's not the entire body. Um, if there's debate about it, that helps us because it's, it's more indicative of, of what the intent or what the law was intended to mean. You, you uh, unlike the U.S. Supreme Court, you have seven justices on the Illinois Supreme Court. Um, you're elected to 10-year terms. Uh, then you can run for retention. Uh, let's take you as one example. Uh, so you started your law career when, 1964? I was sworn into practice law in 1964. I clerked for Justice House of the Illinois Supreme Court for four years. I was state's attorney for four years, and then uh, I was state's attorney and one of the other members of the firm that I was in, and we were partners at that time, was state's attorney in Perry County, and we started having conflicts with uh, what, what other things we could do as a private practitioner. So neither of us ran in, six, in um, 72, and um, then I practiced law until 1986 and ran for circuit judge. And when you practiced <clears throat> law, was it a mix all civil, or was it a mix of civil and criminal? It was mostly civil. We, uh, it was a small firm. We had about 10 partners at one time in three towns, Nashville, Pinckneyville, and DuCoin, which was a little unusual, but down in southern Illinois, uh, it helped to have an office in the town to attract the clientele. Um, we did a lot of municipal work, a lot of school work. Um, we uh, built water lines throughout the country, and we did uh, we built schools, and uh, if we had a, if we had a uh, personal injury case, we usually associated with a personal injury specialist because we didn't do that much trial work. Uh, traffic tickets occasionally, very little in the domestic uh, violence. Nobody wanted to do divorces. Now, you know, one of the things I think is interesting, we, we know who follow politics. I mean, you look at the Illinois legislature, it is controlled by those from Chicago. That's where the uh, votes are. Two-thirds of the legislature is from the Chicagoland area. Whereas the Supreme Court, the way it's structured, you have the different districts. And so here you are as the chief justice uh, from southern Illinois in a rather rural area. That's correct. So I think it's mm -hmm. in some ways, I wanted to say more democratic. I suppose <laughs> one could argue that. But how does it, you know, we have other justices. This is Justice, Justice Burke is from the Chicagoland area. How does your background? And you knowing the people from, you, you're from Nashville, a small little town, uh, but you know the people in that area. You know the heart of those people from your part of the state, as I would say Justice Burke and the other justices would from their districts. What part does that play uh, when you hear the trials, and maybe you can relate to something different than someone else does, when you sit down and have your conferences and debate how the case might go? Does that does, I don't want to make too much of it, but does that play a role that you represent different parts of the state? I, I think we all bring different perspectives to the court. Or somebody might say different baggage to the court. Uh, I think a perspective, uh, I, and none of us as we get into a case have a preconceived notion of how cases should go. But I think um, where you were brought up, uh, how you were brought up, who you associate with, all of that thing goes into our makeup and it goes into our, uh, how we're going to interpret the law and, and uh, how we see different cases. We heard a, a case on oil and gas this week, and uh, that's very big in southern Illinois. It was not high, I mean, it was not such a big ticket item with the Cook County justices, but, but it is an important case, and, and they all agreed to it, but it isn't the kind of thing, they don't have oil wells in, in Cook County. You know, we talked a little bit about some of the, items that uh, the other chief justices preceding you had done. Uh, Justice Kilbride had focused on cameras in the courtroom. He was saying uh, Justice Carmar, uh, or Garman. Garman, thank you. I was going to say Danville. Yeah. Uh, uh, Garman on e-filings. Uh, all these different businesses, anyone who's in business knows how technology over the last 25, 30 years has changed the way we've done business. We know from our homes. Uh, we may have our recipes on a laptop these days instead of uh, all these different uh, cookbooks. How, if in any way, is technology changing the practice of the law and maybe the application of the law? 
Well, I can start with what's happened in our courts and how that's changed and how it's made it much more convenient. We get now um, most of our um, PLAs, petitions for leave to appeal, the briefs, although we get hard copies, we get them electronically, we get them faster, and we have immediate access to the records that the clerk's office maintains here. They're all online. All of us in my office and every office can get uh, can look at the record of the case. Um, I have downloaded onto my iPad every term all of the cases, all of the briefs, uh, all of the, uh, the research memos and, and the things my staff does so that I don't have to carry the briefs with me when I want to read and I do a lot of reading as I travel. Um, that's, that's from the court end of it. Now it seems to me, of course I'm not practicing law, it seems to me that lawyers would find that same thing, that convenience factor of carrying a laptop, being able to do work or add work, send it to his or her secretary, um, be ready to file, and then right now under the e-filing system, being able to file once they've approved a document. If they're in Cook County, they can file a document in Washington County. Uh, it has to change it. I think it's going to change all of it for the better because of access. We are concerned that um, for indigent or self-represented litigants that don't have or may not have as much access to computers or to a kiosk uh, at a courthouse, it might be difficult to file. But they do have that same difficulty with paper filing. Um, with lawyers, um, I think emailing has been a blessing and a bane. I think it's been a blessing because it memorializes conversations in writing that might otherwise take place by phone and then your, the lawyers have to rely on their recollection of what they agreed to didn't agree to. If they put it into an email, it's there. The problem with emails, I've noticed, is sometimes people respond to other emails quickly and without a lot of thought that they would put into a letter and really trying to reason and may say some things they wish they hadn't. So, but I think that's changing. I think people are finding out uh, emails are being maintained and you make copies of them for your paper files. So um, I haven't heard any lawyers really say they don't like e-filing. Uh, I've talked with lawyers who have virtually paperless office, which would scare me right now, but I think it's going to be a thing of the future. How long those e-records last and what medium they're stored in, all of that are still things that uh, we don't know. What were the uh, the photographs? I can't think of the term. The things, uh, the reels they had, they used to st you can put everything on. On, uh, on the, uh, microfish? Microfish, yeah. yeah. That's it. That's, <laughs> even that's so far gone now. Yeah. And so, you know, they went to disks. Is that the end all? Is it thumb drives? Or what is it? It's turn changing so rapidly. Well, and I suppose as we get into the non-physical display of evidence, uh, in the day of uh, photoshopping, then you don't necessarily know if something has been altered or not. But I do know that some of the courtrooms around the state are also becoming updated electronically, so mm -hmm. now they might show a photograph. Uh, several years ago when we were covering the mid-year conference up in Chicago, there was a panel discussion by one of the attorneys, and she was saying, as you described uh, a worker being injured by falling down the stairs, it was one thing to verbally tell a jury, but when you could have the photograph to go back and take and show the actual physical layout, how much mm -hmm. more compelling, as we all say, a, a picture tells a thousand words. Right. Uh, so her point was <clears throat> that was one of the great, great ways that uh, technology was adding to the understanding of cases or the ability to present their side of the case. One of the things that I've been concerned with over the years, and I know in talking with uh, some of the other justices, is the, the cost of, of going to court, the cost of just meeting with a lawyer. And again, you practice law, so on one hand, you want to get paid, you want to be able to make a living at your profession. But I've often thought that uh, the judicial branch is one of the three branches of government. We can go uh, talk to our lawmaker and we don't have to pay them. Uh, there might be someone we, we talk to in the executive branch. 
But when we bump into the judicial branch, we always have to be writing a check because typically it's going to start with a lawyer. Are you concerned uh, as an individual or as, as the process, let's maybe more on the process, how concerned should we all be as citizens as to to what extent is justice denied or delayed by the what can be a, a very expensive process of going to the judicial system? I, I think it's a real concern, and, and we're trying to address that. Um, the, the number of self-represented litigants is growing every year. For that very reason. For that very reason, the cost of access to an attorney, um, access to the courts, and that's the thing that we're always concerned with when we talk about imposition of fees. Uh, legislature, for years, has loved to add on fees to different things because it helps to support the court system, but it, uh, it, it uh, chills access to the court system at the same time. We have, uh, through our Access to Justice Commission, which is part of the Administrative Office of the Illinois Courts, um, they, are, they have prepared and making available online uh, forms that uh, self-represented litigants can use not sophisticated lawsuits. If, if, if it is a sophisticated thing, uh, they're going to need a lawyer and they're going to be able to afford that or a lawyer will take the case. But on a lot of things on mortgage foreclosures or small claims type thing where people want their dispute litigated by an impartial individual, we have to make sure that they have access. Another way that uh, we, I think we're helping that is through the limited scope representation or lawyers who, if, if a person comes into a lawyer's office and says, I can't afford to hire you for this case, but I've written out my complaint. What does that look like? Can you help me put it in right words? A lawyer can do that now and not be responsible for the entire litigation. You have to have a limited scope representation agreement, and that helps. How long has that been around? Oh, I, within the last year. And I don't know the exact date that we adopted, but I think within the last year. The thing that helps, it helps the litigants, but it helps the court too, because one of the hard, harder jobs for judges and circuit clerks is how much help do you give a self-represented litigant without appearing to advise them, legally advise them about things. And it slows down the process if you've got a litigant who can't tell his or her story in court uh, if they have help in filling out these forms. The, um, I guess it's, sometimes it's surprising to me. We went through this period a few years ago when uh, uh, new law students, lawyers getting out of law school, couldn't get a job. And maybe they couldn't afford to do some of the legal work because the debt they accrued was so enormous. But uh, it seems if we have a glut of lawyers, we should have lawyers who would be able to help out people who could not afford the two, three, four, five hundred dollar an hour lawyers uh, that are more prevalent in the larger cities, I believe. In, in <clears throat> fact, I recently uh, spoke with uh, John Thies, who's an attorney over in Champaign, former head of the Illinois Bar Association. Uh, and he, like you, practice general practice in a smaller community, I mean Champaign-Urbana, as right. compared to a Chicago or a St. Louis, let's say. Uh, but he was concerned, he said that when new lawyers would, in the past, as he did, and say as you did, come out and start practicing, you would have a fairly good range of cases. And when these students, as you say now, or these lawyers uh, graduate, they're looking to be making some big dollars, starting maybe at a 70, 80 or uh, so thousands of dollars a year, because they are so burdened with right. their cases. But he said for the practice of law, they're often pigeonholed in a larger firm where they just do one thing and do it repeatedly, and that they don't get the grounding that they used to get. So to that extent, I don't know if you had a thought or concern about it as well. Well, I think that's true. I, I thought, I've always considered myself fortunate in, in being able to start out the practice clerking for a justice and then going into a firm that had a, a diverse practice. Um, again, we didn't do personal injury or... or a lot of marital things after the first 10 years or so. But I had great mentors in the, the members of the firm and, of course, Justice House, who uh, would help me along the way. Uh, and and if, I did, if I was given something or took on a client, 
where I hadn't done it before, I had someone in the firm that had done something similar. So you could go to them, you could find out. And uh, I, it made me a better lawyer, and I think it also made for a better representation of the client. One of the problems I had when I started out, I guess I assumed as a graduate from the University of Illinois, I sh and I passed the bar, I should know the answers to everything. And it was difficult when somebody came in and say, you know, what's, what, what, do, what does this mean? I would try to answer, and then I finally realized I'm dancing around the real, and I finally would say, I'm going to have to look that up. And what surprised me is the clients didn't mind that. In fact, they preferred it. I'll get back to you. And then, of course, then you better get back to them right away. Um, but that helped me once acknowledging that you don't have all of the answers when you start out, and you can use mentors or, or guide, guidance from your fellow lawyers. I've never practiced in a city firm, but I heard of people who were chored with um, billing so many hours and just almost abandoning family life and what have you. And I think there's a trend now to get away from that where the law profession itself recognizes that lawyers have to take care of themselves physically and, and emotionally and mentally and, and take care of family obligations. That was one of the uh, great things about practicing in a small town. I was a minute and a half from home. <laughs> When you look at the law, you and I we should say you, not you just as an individual, but the profession, uh, although you, know, you would also see, every industry needs to change and adapt for a variety of reasons. We've already talked about some mm -hmm. are technological, some are attitudinal as society changes. Uh, we're going to have uh, all kinds of case, cases that uh, one way or another are impacted by, let's say, illegal immigration, which would not have been much of an issue back if we went back to the 1960s or 50s. How does the legal system change? Is there a process for change? Is it going to these conferences and listening to people talk? And, um, and it, it, I'll just throw it out. Is there anything that if you had a magic wand or the things you would like to see change about the judicial system? We, we talked about the cost of it as one, but anything else that uh, should be change, and, and should the legal system be more dynamic as far as being open to change? I think that's probably true. I think, though, that with our, um, as far as the judicial system, with our uh, judicial college that's coming into being, the educational programs that we have, when we see issues that are coming up constantly, we try to provide that education for judges. Um, I'm the liaison for the uh, continuing Legal Education Board of the court. And uh, since that was in, uh, began probably about 12 years ago or so, it's become, a, uh, it's become accepted by lawyers. You need to have the education. And as we, and we, we saw a problem a couple of years ago where um, immigration lawyers were having, uh, were, were being less than professional in some cases. And, and, taking advantage of clients, and it's, of course, ARDC steps in then. But we saw a need then where the Continuing Legal Education Board was able to approve courses for people who wanted to practice immigration laws. I think we have to not only recognize the trends and not be a step behind, but maybe try to get out front. And one of the things that, and, and maybe I do have an agenda with the court, one of the things I want to stress a little bit more is strategic planning for the future and and we have a strategic planning committee that has been active for about a year or two now but I want to take it a next a further step that they really look at what's going on and our judicial conference this October uh, will, that will be the theme what can we do in advance of problems and see what's coming to um, help people after all if we don't provide a forum for people who have grievances, are, are being sued, um, the result is they're going to settle it themselves some way. And if they don't do it by arbitration, uh, maybe back to the old facts and uh, let's settle it out on the street. You know, we don't want that type of thing. Well, and then we sometimes, let's say in the civil uh, cases, uh, different lawsuits that might evolve uh, involving different corporations or such, it can take years, and in the meantime, uh, you're kind of up in the air on how that's going to be resolved while you're still trying to operate a business. I mean, so, 
is, let's go to the funding of the courts. Again, the judicial branch, Justice Kilbride, when he was Chief Justice, would bring up that we're one of the three branches, and I said, he, but he would say, we only get, I forgot what the number was, 2%. Less than 2%. Less than 2%. Still is. And I've been concerned, actually, uh, from listening to some of his conversations, because coincidental, then we had certain cases come up around the state where there was a, a family that was murdered in a county near, not far from Sangamon County, where we are here. Uh, that one case uh, nearly bankrupted the judicial system of that county. It was so expensive to, to bring to trial. Do we have a funding crisis of the court system? Do we need to look at a better business model? And I was preparing for this interview. It, it struck me since we just had this similar argument with uh, our schools. Senator Menard would point mm -hmm. out how the downstate uh, schools are underfunded because they're in an agricultural area or low property, and that you had the really wealthier school districts. There, there wasn't, uh, so you, you were having uh, inequitable education. Are we having inequitable justice because of funding at the county level where some are just going to be uh, destitute courts, so to speak? It, it is a real problem. Uh, first of all, with regard to funding for the Supreme Court, for the judicial branch, uh, that's part of the picture. The other is what happens in the local counties. And we have counties downstate that um, really are struggling, uh, small counties like Gallatin, Pope, low population, no industries going on, uh, very low tax base, and how to support. You can't afford to have a full-time or even a part-time public defender, perhaps. Uh, maybe one or two people work in the clerk's office. It, it really is a problem. But the, the bigger picture for us, of course, is funding of our branch. And as Justice Kilbride so ably pointed out a number of times, we get less than 2% of the total budget. And I might interject, to go back to your earlier comment, then, then we, as who go to the courts, kind of get nickel and dimed on some of the fees. Right, and it's been, it's been a popular thing over the years to add fees. And finally, there was the commission that made a report within the last year um, that came from the legislature and the courts to take a look at um, this, this myriad of fees and how they're added on and where they're found. You can find them in different parts of the statute. And so hopefully that's being clarified. But um, with regard to funding for the courts, you know, we don't have the power of taxation and we don't have police power. We, we are at the mercy of the legislature for funding. Um, and as a chief justice, I have the pleasure to appear before the Senate Appropriations Committee and the House Appropriations Committee. And we're trying to... And you argue for your budget that we, you propose. We argue for the budget, but we argue for the idea that we are a branch of government as opposed to a uh, one of their uh, agencies, agencies or that's sub departments the word I'm right? yeah and and they're all they I'm not sure that everyone understands that because sometimes I have and I've only done this one year I, I see a a look of recognition or enlightenment come over a person's face and say oh yeah well because the question will be asked, you know, we've got these other a other agencies that we're cutting. Why isn't your agency being cutting? We're not an agency, Senator. And we are reliant on that, and, and you have an obligation to fund. And I think that message is getting there, but we have new senators, new representatives, and it, it's a constant. Um, our budget has been flat since 2015. Um, first of all, because no budgets were passed for a couple of years, and this year they passed. We have very, uh, a very resourceful administrative office uh, that has made, uh, allowed us to get through each of the years with that budget. Um, we fund our obligation on funding probation is uh, 100 percent. We we were at 85. I think we just increased that to 88 percent for the last fiscal year. We had some funds available. The biggest. Uh, Part of the pie, of course, is judicial salaries. Some 900 to 1,000 judges who are well paid in Illinois now. Um, but we can't control Do we that. have enough judges? We do. I think we do. There's, there's sometimes there may be concern on allocation um, of judges, where they should be. And, but that, that becomes a circuit problem, and they should be able to uh, take care of that. 
the, uh, the legislature provides for the number of associate judges based on population, and uh, I think we're staffed adequately. And has, has anyone, I don't know, discussed uh, with the legislature at any point having more of a, I don't know, a general tax? Or perhaps does the court system look at saying for some of these small counties, as you mentioned, with the one clerk, uh, is, and, and now that we're dealing with electronic documents as we are, is there some way of maybe having a core functionality for the administration of the courts so that you don't have uh, Sally down in Polk County uh, trying to do that by herself, but that maybe she can have four or five people or 50 people in one core place where some of this paperwork can be processed. I don't know if that's going to happen. You know, we have, um, we have this dual funding system. The circuit clerks um, are paid by the counties. They're not, they're not and they're, they're elected by counties. And so the counties want to keep control of what, what's happening in each of those offices. With the advent of e-filing, though, um, our administrative office is helping in those areas, and uh, the legislature did give us a $9 fee, I think, that is dedicated to offsetting the cost of e-filing throughout the state of Illinois, uh, which we can use to help each of the counties, at least initially. Um, and there should be, should eventually be savings in cost, even for those offices, by using e-filing. Um, ideally, uh, the state, if the state were to fund fully the court system, including circuit clerks, and we'd have that uh, ability to help them, it would be better. But, otherwise, but that's not going to happen. And it's not going to happen because in some counties, um, in some of them the larger, the fees that are generated are really uh, uh, help to provide funds to the county coffers. In some counties, the fees don't generate enough to, uh, to take care of the needs of the county or of the clerk's office. Let me ask you, as, as I've had the uh, pleasure of being around the different justices over the years from time to time, it seems that you are all very collegial, not just the seven current members, but as, uh, as I've witnessed over the, the last 15 years or so, Ostensibly, there's some partisanship, but again, it, it doesn't seem to be unlike certainly the legislative, where tensions can be high. Um, but I grew up in, in Missouri, and, and people of Illinois may or may not know that not every other state elects justices uh, to the court. Uh, they're more like the U.S. Supreme Court in many states. They're appointed. Now, in Illinois, and you're a perfect example of this, the cost of election. Uh, and the amount of money that people will throw at an election either to elect someone or to defeat you, and you were, again, a prime example of this uh, back in the retention and, and the initial time when you ran back in 2004. It's now cost, cost millions of dollars to get elected to the court. And there have been, there's, uh, many critics say, you know, that's unseemly, that uh, justices shouldn't be out with a tin cup raising money. Maybe we should have a an appointed system. What, do you have any thoughts on should we change the way that we bring people to the Illinois Supreme Court? I guess ideally if we could find a perfect system of, uh, of uh, appointments, uh, merit selection, that would be outstanding. I, I had the opportunity to appear before the Missouri Bar in um, St. Louis and the Bar Metropolitan Area, uh, St. Louis Metropolitan Area Bar, well, I'm not sure what they call it. And Justice Mary Russell just, just served a term as Chief Justice of Missouri, and I were on the panels. And uh, I knew that I was an example of what wasn't good, basically, uh, uh, compared to the Missouri system. But, um, and someone asked me the question, why don't you have your governor's appoint like we do here? And I said, well, then we'd have to go to, we'd find George Ryan in prison, we'd find Bogoyevich in prison, we'd find Dan Ryan in prison, and we'd find Otto Kerner in prison. Now, how many... Why would we consider that uh, we're going to have merit selection? It's a problem no matter what. Even after my election, and I, I said at one point, you know, the amount of money that was being spent on both sides, and it was fairly even. We were within a, well, either a few thousand or, or less, uh, less than 100,000 difference on each side. But I said the amount of money being spent on this is obscene. Um, it, it creates a perception that, uh, that 
it should not go down well. Um, fortunately, we don't. We can't raise funds, so I didn't know where funds came from. The general public doesn't know that. They assume that if you know, if uh, what are there committees? How is that done? You have to have a committee, and you can't accept contributions. And you can take a look at the uh, donor list if you want. I never did. I didn't want to know um, uh, until I had occasion to have to know whether someone had contributed, and I needed to recuse myself. But uh, after that election, the um, I don't the, know the original was, or the the original yeah. in 2004, I think it was the Bren Brennan Center for Justice uh, had someone do a survey in Illinois about the merits of merit selection elected, and all of the answers came out. Uh, yeah, it would be good, all of that, and then the final question is: thing Would you rather elect or have your judge appointed? And 80 percent, and even down in my area, 80 to 85 percent said elected judges. So Illinois is not going to change that. I'd take a constitutional change. Um, even with, with the uh, 1970 Constitution, if you recall, if you were old enough to recall that, um, there was a separate issue on the ballot as to whether uh, in adopting that Constitution there should be appointed or elected judges. Cook County actually voted for appointed, and the rest of the state... Uh, had more than enough votes to set, uh, offset that, and so we have the system we have now. Um, the perception is really the concern, and the money has gotten bigger, and uh, politicians have gotten involved. They see it as a way, perhaps, to get people who are attuned to their thought, uh, maybe elected to courts. Well, it begs <clears throat> the issue that someone is going to rule on a political basis and not the legal, narrow legal, as we talked earlier, definition right. of what does it say in the book, the way the law was written. It does. That they would rule, f and then that would undermine the respect for the rule of law if within the population they think, uh, as the governor has used the term pejoratively, uh, politicians in robes. <laughs> As I said earlier, we as the court, the, the judicial branch, we do not have the power of the purse or the power, the police power. The only thing we have is integrity and the ability to make people understand that we are ruling on the basis of the law and not on the basis of political patronage or other. If we lose that, then we have problems. Well, Justice Carmar, we appreciate you taking the time. I'm sure we could talk longer, but <laughs> yeah. we'll let you go, and we appreciate you explaining all this to me, and uh, well, good luck to you in the court. It's, it's my pleasure to be here. I think it's incumbent upon members of the judiciary, and especially the Supreme Court, to um, be accessible to people who may have questions like this, and I hope this helps to some degree. It does. Thank you. Okay. You're watching the Illinois Channel an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. 